Good morning, everybody. Great to see you this wonderful morning. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you would, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, as for the next few weeks, we see what the Word of God has to say about love as the Lord defines it and explains it and calls us to it. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. He said, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthian church having just explained that there is a great and wide variety of gifts given of the Lord to the body of Christ, the church, that all fit together for God's glory, now comes along and he says, I show you still a more excellent way. And he takes as if all of those gifts together and he says, but if you do it all, if you have them all, if you have ascend to the height of gifting, of talent, of blessing, of service, of sacrifice, and he said, you don't have love, you're like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It's just pointless noise, hollow, empty. He said, I am nothing and it profits nothing. You can be a great speaker. He says, if I have the tongues of men and of angels, compelling and powerful, sharp and clear. You can be a great singer, stirring the flesh in the ears of the masses. Brilliant writer, a scholar, a theologian, a gifted linguist, that understands everything in proper context in deep layers of theology. So you can have all that. And he said, if you're found without love, you're like some little four-year-old kid, come over here with a stick on this drum kit and wail on those cymbals and make our ears bleed. He said, it's as good as that. He said, it's of the same value as a noisy gong. People that name the name of Christ make a lot of noise in the name of the mission. There are things that we say we do for the kingdom. There are as much that is done. A lot of noise gets made. Jesus' name gets put on it. I did that for Jesus. I'm here for Jesus. We travel far and wide. Jesus called us to, and we say it's for him. We feed the poor. We clothe the needy. He comes along and he said, I'll tell you what, if I even get to the place where I give my body to be burned as a martyr, and I don't have love, it meant nothing. It was for no one. It was for myself. It was for our own glory. It was for our own applause, our own praise. The Lord spoke to the prophet Zechariah a long time ago to God's people. And he asked the question. He said, when you fasted and mourned for me for the last 70 years, the Lord said, was it really for me that you did that? Who, who was that about? 
And the indictment, of course, that is clearly implied is it wasn't for the Lord. It looked like it was for the Lord. They said it was for the Lord. They did it in the name of the Lord. They spoke about the Lord, but it was for them. They were a noisy gong. Who's it for? Who the Bible studies for sometimes? Right? We can study all day long about the Lord, but really it was about us. It was for us. Was it really for him? What was the serving for? What were the mission trips for? Comes along today and he asks the same question. Who's it for? Was that for me? And so the only way you know is, was it out of love? Out of love for who? First and foremost, God for who he is. Did I do it out of the overflow of my heart because I loved God and whether anybody saw it, whether anybody clapped, whether anybody said good job, whether anybody noticed, whether I ever received an award, a trophy or not, or whether nobody ever saw it, I know the Lord saw it and I did it for him. Would that be enough? Prophet Jonah, at the end of the greatest revival in recorded biblical history, when he preached the word of the Lord throughout the streets of Nineveh, having been given a second chance by the Lord after he rebelled against God, says every man, woman, child, even the animals, the people put sackcloth and ashes on him as a gesture of humility and repentance before the Lord. It said everybody repented. Everybody stood before the Lord with a holy, reverent fear. And God relented concerning his calamity. He pulled back the judgment that was pronounced against them and gave them grace. It was a smashing success. And Jonah was at the forefront of it. Jonah got to preach it. Sometimes I'll go places and, uh, you know, you just want to feel that power, you know. You got to be careful. You don't want it to be about yourself, but you want to see God work. You know, Moses stood by the burning bush and it said the bush was burned, but was not consumed. And the Lord stood in the midst of the fire and spoke to Moses and take off your sandals for the ground on which you stand is holy ground. You know, sometimes in the work of the Lord, he doesn't owe it to us, but we want to stand close to the burning bush. We want to see that changed life. We want to see that family raised from the dead. You want to see that dark, wicked soul come out of the waters of baptism and everybody weeps. And in those moments, we stood close to the burning bush. We get to see and feel the heat of the glory of God. I love that stuff. Sometimes when I'm going to preach the gospel somewhere, I'll read about that revival in Nineveh to get myself hyped. You know, so far, there's only one evangelistic effort where every single person repented. But I still have hope for another. Sometimes I'm like, maybe this is the one, you know. Everyone's going to fall down before the power of God. They're going to repent. They're going to throw ashes on themselves. I'm sorry. They're going to come to Jesus. It's going to be amazing. You know, so I'll read that and I think, man, this is the power of the word of God. Not the preacher, not the man, not the oratory, the spirit of God through his word. I get excited about it. Now, read Jonah sometimes, you know, feel a little something. Who's that for? Look at Jonah chapter four. How do you feel about that? Everybody repents. What was on the inside, though? On the outside, there was much noise. He walked through the city for three days, preaching the accurate word of the Lord. People heard it, responded. But what was on the inside? Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. When he saw it, when he heard it, when he felt it, said, but it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. Why? Why? He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. I knew that if they repented, you'd be merciful. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For death is better for me than life. And the Lord said, 
do you have good reason to be angry? As if he's saying, you of all people ought to know because a couple days ago from the belly of the great fish, you cried out for the same mercy and I gave it to you. But he'll take it for him. But he wants wrath and judgment for Nineveh. Why? Because though on the outside he is a preacher, though on the outside he is an evangelist, though on the outside he appeared to be obedient, on the inside he had no love whatsoever. It's a noisy gong, clanging cymbal. And he never does come to a place of true love and compassion. He had no hope whatsoever that Nineveh would repent and be saved at his preaching and the power of God. What he really had a hope for was that they would deny the message and that God would rain his vengeance and judgment on their head and he would watch with joy. That's what he wanted. He has no love. It profited him nothing. He is nothing. You know, people look at Jonah sometimes, they're like, man, Jonah, I don't get it. I don't get how Jonah could be like that. You just got to find your Ninevite, and then you'll start to understand. It's not okay. That person that abandoned you, that person that abused you, there's your Ninevite. That person that hurt and humiliated you, and they're still not sorry. They stole from you. They assaulted you did unspeakable things. Do you want them to repent and receive the grace and the mercy of God, salvation from heaven, joy and peace, blessing? See, and you say, that's impossible. That's impossible for me to love them, for me to want that. And I say to you, you're right. It's impossible. No act of our will, no effort of our flesh, no wishing of our heart can make us really love them. Out of an honest and pure heart, that has to be a miracle from God. 1 John chapter 4, over to the right in your Bible, deep to the right, 1 John chapter 4. The love that the Word of God calls us to must come from God. We will never get it on our own. You're not going to find it within yourself. You're not going to make yourself do it and live it and feel it and be that. You cannot. It has to be from the very God who calls you to it. He gives it to those who are his. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who, is, who loves is born of God and knows God. If you love the way the scripture calls us to, that is the evidence, the fruit that you know God, you love God, and he empowers you to love the way he called you to. Verse eight, for the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, was brought and shown to us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. He showed us his love. The Bible says God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, not when we cleaned it up for first. Verse 10, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the atonement, the payment, the only payment that God would accept on our behalf. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also love one another. Love is from God, but the world will try to tell you they have an offer for you too. They have a definition to give to you. People in the whole world, they ask, you know, like, how do I love better? How do I learn to love my spouse, my kids, my friends, my family, people in my life I, I want to love? And so a great many books continue to be sold. This is what love is, and this is how you can practice love. And here are some tips on how to give and receive love properly so that you will have functional relationships and people continue to pay money only to be left empty and hollow and fruitless. And so someone comes along with a new book and they're like, you know, six layers of love and seven practical steps of love and six applications of this. And so people will buy it. And the world will offer that to us and they'll say, this is what love is. And people believe it. They portray it in movies and we pay for the same story to be told to us every time. 
Every time, the same people have the same problems. And in the middle of the movie, we're scared. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, man. And then something happens. And you're like, oh, man, she's starting to see it in him. It's going to happen. Like, she sees what we see. He sees what we see. He's going to go for it. And then they go for it. And they're like, they got together, and we come out of the theater crying. We paid $1,000 to bring three people in there and eat popcorn. And we're like, man, have you seen this movie? We've all seen this movie 500 times. It's the same movie. Why do we buy it? Why do we want it over and over? Because we want to feel it. We are craving something. The world is going after something they don't fully understand, don't have the capacity to be, but yet they have that lack in their life. So the world offers cotton candy to fill it. We're left sick and hungry at the end. So then two people will see it and they'll ride home in the car and it'll get awkwardly quiet. Everything okay? Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. I just feel like something's off between us, you know? I just kind of. So now this has gotten in somebody. And now an expectation has been built. And now a dissatisfaction has been sown and has already taken root. And by the time you get home to your driveway, and like, I just wish, you know, I wish we could have something like that. <laughs> and so, so one party or another is obligated to set up the therapy appointment so they can figure it out. So they're like, well, let's, let's, let's learn, you know? Like, let's learn. There's some, there are people that help with this stuff. If you're doing this right now, I'm not mocking you, but I am going to try to lead you to a good conclusion, you know? And so you go pay $100 an hour for someone to sit with you and fill out a survey and say, you know, well, where are you most happy? And where is your biggest lack? And what is your biggest opportunity? And what does he do the best? And what does she do the worst? And, and you fill it out and you're like, okay, well, that'll be $100 each. And then we'll talk for a half hour next week about these things. And then you come back and you talk about it. You're like, Why are you here today? Well, we just want to learn how to love our relationships, bro. We, don't, we just don't know how to do it. You can help us do it, right? I can help you do it, a guru will say. And you pay all your money and you talk for hours and people cry and people make promises and you have this false hope that it's going to change. And everything becomes about feelings and deeds and words and sex and this is going to fix it and it doesn't fix it. And then we're led to the dark conclusion that, well, maybe it's just me and you are never going to work. Because real love can't come from the world. If it doesn't come from God, we don't have it and we don't have the capacity to do it. That's why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, you are taught by God to love. How are we taught by God? It says, for the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. When we have the Holy Spirit, the love of God begins to emanate because the very character of who we are has been changed from the inside. And we do it not by intellect, not by effort, not by will, but by miraculous change. Then the Bible comes along and says in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that we have the Spirit, the first one listed is love as the word defines it, not how we feel, not an emotion, not an attraction, not a lust, not a fake fairy tale. Love of God, the fruit of the spirit is love, it says. And then we're able to do things we were never able to do before and we don't even have an explanation as to why because the Holy Spirit is beginning to work change in our life. And the Bible calls us, commands us as Christians to love in very specific ways, to very specific people. For example, husbands, the word of God comes along and says, love your wives. Well, how, God, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? Well, how do I do that? You can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. The Bible calls wives to love their husbands, to respect their husbands. We can't do it by the world's wisdom. Love our children. I want to love our children. The world will say, I want to love my children. I just don't know how to do it right. The word of God comes along and says, the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom, the understanding, the patience, the compassion, the power to do it. It calls us to love one another. It calls us to love our neighbor, love strangers, foreigners, 
Enemies. Love your enemy. Forgive. Love forgives in the Bible. Love endures all things, it says. The hurt, the pain, the betrayal, the sorrow. The love of the scripture endures that, meaning you take it. The onslaught of it. You endure it somehow and you come out the other side at peace and not only at peace, but with love for the one who did it to you. That is a miracle. That is as much of a miracle as the parting of the Red Sea. And the Lord says, when I pour out my Holy Spirit in your heart, you'll be able to do things like this. Turn the other cheek, Jesus said. Have real peace and real contentment. This is what the world starves for. They long for, and they'll pay anything to get it and anyone to tell them how to do it, and they can't do it because they're not coming to the proper source who is God. Some people here today who have had some of these same conversations and struggles and desires and have come to the same empty conclusions. It's because you have yet to come to God to do it in you. We can't do what only he can do. So love comes from God and by his spirit. And you say, well, how do I receive his spirit to do that? First John chapter three. Verse 23, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. He says, you got to believe in Jesus Christ first, and then he calls us to love one another as he commanded us because you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit without having truly believed in Jesus. Verse 24, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Over a page, 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides or lives in him or her, and he in God. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. We cannot love the way the Bible calls us to without the Holy Spirit. We cannot have the Holy Spirit without truly coming to Jesus, thereby being indwelled with the Holy Spirit. But people want the results of the Holy Spirit without the Redeemer. I sat with a guy years ago. We were having coffee and he asked me a question and he had observed some things in my life, I guess. You know, people are watching you out there. Just a little side sermon. People are watching you at your office, at your school, friends you've had short or a long time. Especially if you say you're a Christian, they're watching they're taking note, they're seeing the fruit of your life, if there is any. And he, we sat together and he said, you know, he said, I've seen your marriage and I've seen your family and your relationship to your kids. I understand, I don't have a perfect marriage, I'm not a perfect dad. Anything good in this story is because of the blessing of the Lord, okay? That's not a fake humble brag either. It's not, it's not because of my wisdom, it's in spite. It's in spite of my sin. It's in spite of my shortcomings. I just want to make sure to put the glory where it belongs, okay? It was because of the Lord. Same for your life. And he said, you know, I want what you have. He said, I, w I want a marriage like you have. I want a family like you have. He said, I, I, want, I, want, I want that. He said, can you tell me how, to, how, you, how do you do that? And I said, man, listen, you called a Christian. You knew that. He said, no, I know, I know. And I said, I, I've told you before, I came to believe in Jesus and he changed who I am. And it's by his power that I can even be a husband to my wife. 
My wife believes in Jesus and she has been made a new creation and it's by his power that she can even be the wife that you see and we have the marriage we have. And the Bible says, raise the kids in the wisdom and admonition of the Lord. You can't even do that without knowing the Lord first. And you said, you don't believe those things. And I'm not mad or judgmental at you, but you, you called me. It is a miracle what you see and you don't want that. And he said, no, it's not that. He said, I just, I still respect your morality. I, I want to know your principles and I believe in your ethics. I just don't believe in Jesus. I said, dude, like this isn't a buffet. Like, and I'm not, you know, trying to denigrate this man or anybody like him, maybe sitting here now, but I'm telling you as, as urgently as I can, this is no buffet. You don't walk by the power of God unto salvation and go, I want a little peace and I want a good family and I, I want some goodness in my life and I want humility and I want blessing and I want this wisdom, but I don't want the king. It doesn't work like that, man. My life is dead and he has raised me to walk in newness of life. You don't, you don't get those things without the one who gives them. Yes. So he wants to walk by. You know, can you do a lot without Jesus? You can. You can do things. You can be religious without Jesus. A lot of people are religious there might be some people here now. You know, you can, you can come here. You know, you don't have to know Jesus to sit here. You don't have to know Jesus to sing these songs, to carry a Bible. You don't have to know Jesus to even say you're a Christian. You can be religious. You can be fairly moral. There are people out there that don't know Jesus that are pretty honest. They don't really lie or steal. They're on the outside, by the world's standard, nice people. You can be a provider. You can be a husband, a wife. You can have a family, a job. You can be generous. You can serve. Not a Christian. You don't have the power of God and you don't love like the Lord called you to. It's impossible. Saul of Tarsus was extremely religious. Never missed a service. Never missed an opportunity to learn. Never missed an opportunity to serve. The Bible reveals he had no love at all. He was gripped and arrested by the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. And he repented of his sin. And he truly became a Christ follower. And he was never the same man, but he was always religious. There are people that are religious. They're a Christian on Sunday and sometimes a devil on Monday. But, you know, they think. But they don't have the Holy Spirit, and so we don't love the way the, only the Spirit can empower us to do so. The Bible says when we come to Christ, he says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So when we see the Bible and we're like, that's hard. In fact, that's impossible in our flesh and in our intellectual understanding. We are correct. But all of a sudden we find ourselves by some other power within ourselves doing those things, being those things, offering forgiveness, offering mercy, showing love as God called us to. And we don't even understand how. A lady came up to me after the service just earlier today. And she said, man, she said, I was ready to leave my husband. I filed for divorce. And I didn't love him at all. And I said, I don't love you at all. And I'm leaving you. And she said, I went to work a little while after that. And a man came up to me I'd never met before. And he said, you seem upset. I'm about to get a divorce. And he shared the gospel with me. And something about it and its simplicity and its power, I turned from my sin right there in the aisle. I came to tears. I confessed Jesus as Lord. And she said, when I went home, I immediately started to feel the ability to love my husband like I never had before. That is a new spirit. That is a new heart. That is a miracle. Bible says that you will be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. You may show by your life the fruit of the Holy Spirit and what the will of God is. Can't do it without the Spirit. Can't have the Spirit without Jesus. 
That's why a lot of people, they try and they try and they want to. They feel conviction. They see needs and opportunities in their life. They try and they try and they fail and they fail and they don't know why. Because they're operating by your own power. And we've got to let all our power die and fall at the foot of the cross and say, God, here I am, all my failings, all my shortcomings, all my sin and darkness, and I come to you and I need to be rescued, I need to be saved, I need to be made a new creation. Love is from God. Would you bow for prayer this morning? Somebody today, right now, somewhere, you say, Wes, I, I don't feel at rest in my heart about these things. And I feel God stirring in me. I feel a disturbance in my spirit. I don't have this peace. I don't think I have the Holy Spirit in my life. I've known religion. I've known tradition. I've known church. I've known things. I've done things but I don't know God. Not like that. There's no fruit in my life, especially the fruit of love anywhere to be seen. Will you come to him today by faith? Will you turn from the dead works of sin, the failed wisdom of the world, our empty, endless efforts, Will you come to Jesus for real? Maybe you prayed a prayer somewhere in your life, signed some paperwork, but you just know right now it wasn't real. You didn't give him your heart. You didn't surrender your soul. If I'm talking to you, if the Spirit of God is calling to you, turn to him now. There are no special words. You bow your head. You surrender your will, all your past. You say, Jesus, I, here I am. Ask him to save you, to cleanse you, to wash you, to make you a new creation. Do it right now. If you're here, if you're out there listening somewhere, call to the Lord. My brothers and sisters in Jesus in here today, maybe you know the Lord, but we've been polluted by the world. We've let the failed wisdom of society creep in. We've been trusting too much in our own power, maybe. We need to recenter ourselves on his word and by his spirit and through repentance. Say, God, I'm sorry. I've gotten off track. I was distracted. I, I have failed. Renew in me a right spirit again, Lord. Plant my feet upon the rock. Whatever the Lord may be speaking to your life today, open your heart, hear, and respond. Respond. 